recording okay. and you're on okay at this critical moment in the history of our nation at the brink of what is arguably the most important election of our lives i'm honored to introduce to you one of our most distinguished prize-winning political analysts ej dion what uh what you might call the backstory of this is it started a couple of years ago when we met at a conference at the New School in New York. We started to talk about when we when we met at the conference, we started to meet, talk about Scranton. And you may have noticed that Scranton is frequently in the news. I, EJ expressed an interest in coming here. At that time, it was to be before our primary. A lot has happened since then. The Trump administration and pandemic hovering over us have changed our lives dramatically and cost us many thousands of lives. Uh, EJ is surely one of the most sought after experts, as I said, and in this particular moment, it, our politics and our future as a nation have never been more in question. Today, we are ne nervous. Well, some of us are on edge as the election is the most important in our future. The word vote, for example, has never been used as much and a great relief, a symbol of our democracy. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have this scholar and journalist who knows us, and that is he knows us as a nation, knows us as a people. And in his most recent book, Code Red, How Progressives and Moderates Can Unite to Save the Country, he offers us some valuable advice. The question it poses, if I may paraphrase, and it might be wrong, are we able to save ourselves from ourselves? Recalling that Benjamin Franklin back in 1787 remarked that we're a republic if you can keep it, and Abraham Lincoln in his Gettysburg Address in 1863 questioned our ability to endure, we are still facing, facing the question of our existence. Are we a has-been at odds with ourselves or a work in progress? We're yearning to learn more about that and our prospects or for the future. So please join me in welcoming to this Zoom podium, remarkable political analyst, E.J. Dion. Uh Thank you all so much. You know, after that extraordinary introduction, first of all, it's better than the one I once got, which ended. And now for the latest dope from Washington, here is E.J. Dion. Uh, but that was such a, a, a brilliant summation of American history that I feel I should sit down and Sandra, you should give this talk, not me. Um, I'm reminded of one of my favorite political, I, I like the tradition of heckling good-natured heckling. And uh, there's a great story of Al Smith when he was running for governor of New York and a heckler got up uh, and, and sort of yelled at Smith, uh, tell us all you know, Al, it won't take long. And Al Smith being a clever guy looked at the heckler and said, uh, I'll, tell them all we, I'll tell them all we both know and it won't take longer. Um, and I feel I should just tell that joke and say, Sandra, you tell them, I'll just go, uh, and sit down. But thank you for doing this. Sandra, as you know, worked at the National Endowment for the Humanities, who worked for Governor Casey, um, her husband, who is on here. Uh, if you see, he's got a wonderful Zoom picture at his law office. Uh, if you follow on Twitter, there is something called Room Raider. He would win a 10 over 10 for that room uh, that he's in. Um, I also want to say what an honor it is to be at the University of Scranton. Um, at this point in American history, you can say, move over Paris, move over London, move over Rome, Scranton is now the center of the world. I don't think we have heard uh, more mention of many other cities in our country over the last year uh, than the great city of Scranton, Pennsylvania. And I've, I've always felt an affinity uh, for Scranton because I also grew up in a mill town um, in Massachusetts uh, called Fall River. Um, and I like old industrial towns so much that I go out of my way uh, to visit them. Um, and I still think that that past in our country's history can be our future as well, but we can talk a bit about that in the Q&A. I think a lot of the great old communities of our country still have a lot uh, to give. I also am very comfortable um, and happy to be at a Jesuit university 
Although the, the history of Scranton, the University of Scranton is amazing how many different iterations uh, it has had. It's probably, it's coalition building when you look at the whole Catholic uh, tradition and all the other folks who have been uh, in charge of that university. But you have such a distinguished faculty. I think some of them might be here today. Susan Paulson, who's uh, got a recent book on women's suffrage. Joanna Hopper, who's done great work on environmental policy, Michael Allison on Latin America, Gretchen Van Dyke on the Kennedy administration and God bless her on civic education. Uh, it's just a great university and I am really honored to be here and I only wish I could be there uh, in person, um, but I'm glad that all of you are here and I'm grateful you're here. Um, we were talking, I don't know if the sound was on, we were talking about James Carville um, the uh, great uh, raging cage and the great political um, uh, uh, operative uh, that doesn't do him justice from Louisiana. And whenever I get depressed about the state of national politics or whenever I got depressed about the state of politics in my home state of Massachusetts, you can always think about Louisiana politics, which is both colorful and let us say not always the most notoriously honest state um, in the country. And there is a great character down there called Edward Edwards, uh, who alas ended up at the slammer, but he had a wonderful sense of humor as a politician. Um, he once uh, was running when he was trying to get back to being governor um, many years ago. It was in the middle of a great rece a recession. Uh, unemployment was 11%. And he knew everybody in the state knew he was less, let's say less than fully honest and so he got up in a debate and said, if you reelect my opponent, there'll be nothing left for me to steal, uh, he said. Um, and he actually kept both promises because the economy came roaring back and he eventually went to jail. But he also had my favorite attack that any candidate leveled against another candidate. He said of the same opponent, uh, my opponent is so dumb that it takes him two hours to watch 60 Minutes. Uh, and I guess we recently had an experience on that where you could watch President Trump's interview with 60 Minutes twice. So I guess that would give you the uh, two hours. But I'm really, really pleased to, to be here. And I hope to get up to Scranton uh, again one of these days. I had my brothers-in-law had a, uh, a house together out in the Poconos. So I used to pass through uh, on various occasions. I wanna talk a bit about my book, Code Red, and I, I hear people are a little bit interested in politics right now. So I might talk a bit about the election. Um, again, I don't know if you overheard our conversation, but I have said that uh, I resigned my membership uh, in the Prognosticators Union at around midnight on election night uh, in 2016. Uh, but it's also true that you can't chase the bookie from the track. Uh, so I am prepared to say, talk about where I think this election is going. Um, and as Sandra said, and it's really true that um, this is, I think, the most important elections in the lifetime of all of us. Uh, we say that a lot, election after election. Uh, this time, I think it's actually true. And uh, we can get into that. And I wrote my book, Code Red, uh, because I really did see that coming. Uh, I did um, uh, feel that that was the case. Uh, everyone could see it coming, but I felt very strongly um, that uh, if we continued on the track we were on as a nation, uh, we would be in very, very deep jeopardy in a variety of ways. And I was particularly worried. I am somebody on, broadly speaking, on the progressive side of politics. I call myself a liberal or a social democrat. I'm a liberal Catholic. Catholic. Uh, I go by a lot of labels, but it's all of them are broadly on uh, the progressive side of politics. And the first sentence of my book written uh, at the end of last year came out at the beginning of this year in February was will progressives and moderates feud while America burns. Uh, and I was very worried that people who think of themselves as moderate or on the center left um, and people who think of themselves as uh, more progressive might spend a lot of their time uh, arguing with each other, which is fine, but also tearing each other apart, which is not so fine, uh, at a moment when I believed that these forces needed to come together uh, to fight two forms of radicalization on the right side 
of our politics. Uh, form one had been happening in the Republican Party for a very long period of time. And then form two was the particular radicalism of President Trump um, on issues, issue after issue from immigration uh, to human rights, to civil rights, to uh, uh, the very idea of what kind of country are we in terms of race and racial equality um, and on a, in a whole bunch of areas having to do with the basic norms uh, of governance. Um, and my view is that at this moment in history, moderates and progressives, whatever differences they have, uh, have more, far more in common than they sometimes have wanted uh, to realize. Um, let's take three issues that were major issues during uh, the Democratic primaries. Um, we argued a lot about health care, with one side saying uh, that we need to move quickly toward a single payer uh, health care system, uh, Medicare for all system. The other side saying, no, that's not advisable. What we really need to do is to build on Obamacare, perhaps have a public option and get everyone insured that way. That's a legitimate argument to have. We saw that argument fought out in a lot of the Democratic debates. But when you look at what each side was saying, um, what brought them together, the principle that every single American should have good, affordable health insurance, that is the principle. And the other two are methods to get there. Indeed, you can argue that building on Obamacare can be seen as a path toward a single payer uh, health care. Uh, second issue that I talk about is climate change. There was uh, the proposal for the Green New Deal uh, that AOC and Senator Ed Markey came out with that came under a lot of attack, uh, but it was really based on a fundamental principle, two, two basic ideas that I think everyone on the moderate and progressive side could agree with. One is we need urgent action on climate because it endangers our, the very planet on which we live. Uh, and if we doubted that, we can just look around at the kind of weather we've had, the kind of damage that's been done all over the world. Um, uh, but also, this must be done in a way that builds the economy. A lot of people who are prepared to act uh, on the environment are very worried about what impact various environmental measures might have on the economy. So uh, action on climate must also be linked to action on the economy and on jobs. Um, thirdly, the whole question of uh, access to higher education and also to post-secondary training. Um, a lot of people in the country uh, uh, have, cannot go to college or cannot get the training they need to get good jobs uh, after uh, high school. Bernie Sanders proposed uh, free tuition at all public universities. Now that's not as radical as we seem. There are people on this call who are old enough to remember when state universities really did not cost very much money um, back 30, 40 years ago where they were not quite free, but they came very close uh, to that. Uh, on the other hand, moving there quickly would be very expensive. I picked these three issues partly because they were major issues that Bernie Sanders uh, ran on, but partly because I saw all of them as amenable to compromise. Now, one of the heartening things when you write a book is sometimes you talk about ideas and they go nowhere. Uh, and sometimes you write about ideas and things that you sort of made a case for came to pass. And I think since Joe Biden won the Democratic nomination, you've seen an extraordinary coming together uh, between the more moderate wing of the Democratic Party, plus, by the way, an awful lot of moderate Republicans. I'll have more to say about that, including your own uh, governor, Tom Rich, um, have come together um, and said, you know, we can bridge some of these differences because we want to move in the same direction. Um, so Joe Biden stuck with his position that he did not want to move toward single payer, um, but he does want a public option. And he proposed that we lower <coughs> the Medicare eligibility age to age 60, um, which is actually a very good idea because again, anyone on this call who is um, of that age knows how hard it is for older people to get by themselves a private insurance policy at age 60. Um, you know, those private insurance companies really aren't crazy about insuring us once we get to a certain age because we are very expensive. That's just the reality of the marketplace. Um, and so they came together around that, around college and job training. 
Biden said, we can't afford to give free college to everybody. And besides, there are people who can afford it. Well, let's do it for people with in families of $145,000 a year or less. And then on, um, on uh, climate, um, Biden has a very ambitious program, which is built around constructing a green economy in ways that will create uh, millions of new jobs. So just taking those issues, that is part of what I was talking about in Code Red and why I think um, you know, we see in this election a chance to move forward. Um, one of the things that's disappointed me over the last uh, 20 uh, to 25 years um, is the movement in the Republican Party, what I see as the radicalization of the Republican Party. I, I always like to tell people that one of my dirty little secrets is that I was a teenage liberal Republican. Um, the reason that's a dirty little secret is about the most boring thing you could be as a teenager is to be a liberal uh, Republican. But it was a tradition that I very much admired that I grew up um, in Massachusetts in a Republican family. Um, and I was attracted to progressive ideas, but there were people uh, in that party, um, people uh, like Ed Brooke in Massachusetts, uh, uh, people like Mac Mathias, a great progressive senator from uh, Maryland who later endorsed a Republican who later endorsed Barack Obama, Jacob Javits in New York, Clifford Case um, in, uh, 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 in New Jersey, your own John Hines in, uh, um, in Pennsylvania. These were people willing to use um, government to solve public problems. And they had some differences with Democrats, but they worked together to try to get things done through government. Uh, by the time I turned about 17 or 18, I decided the liberal Republican thing really didn't work anymore. Little did I know how much that would uh, prove to be uh, the case. Uh, and what I've been disappointed by is just the steady radicalization of the Republican Party. It, it really began uh, in a certain sense um, with the Goldwater campaign in 1964, um, it began with that famous line from Ronald Reagan, a much more cheerful and open president than the one we have now, for sure. Um, but when he said that the greatest joke in the world was one of the major lies in the world was, I'm here from the federal government and I'm here to help you. Um, it seemed to me that broke with with the whole tradition of the Republican Party itself. Abraham Lincoln created the land-grant colleges. Abraham Lincoln had the Homestead uh, Act. Teddy Roosevelt created the national parks. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower created the student loan program that helped me go to college and probably some others on this call, the National Defense Education Act built uh, the interstate highway system. The Republican Party historically was not a party that believed that government always made things worse. Um, but it became much, much more radical, starting with Newt Gingrich in the, in the 1990s um, and has continued down uh, that path. I think one of the reasons thus why arguments in the Democratic Party are so fierce is a lot of people in the country who once used to be moderate or liberal Republicans are now uh, inside the Democratic Party simply because there was no room for them uh, anymore uh, in the Republican Party after the 2018 elections, which saw uh, the election of an enormous number of extraordinary people, particularly women, by the way, the, the new class of 2018 uh, produced the largest class of women entering the House. On, they were all on the Democratic side in history. And I, I met with a bunch of them after the election and that many of them, as you know, represented suburban districts, those outer Philadelphia suburbs our great swing area in American politics, that used to be the heartland of moderate to liberal Republicanism. Um, and those kinds of districts are now uh, sending uh, Democrats to Congress. And I looked at some of them and I said, you know, a generation or two ago, so many of you might have been liberal Republicans. And uh, half of them were outraged and said, there's no way I'd ever be a Republican in my life. And the other half said, yeah, that's probably right, given what a uh, moderate or progressive Republican used to be. And so you have inside the Democratic Party uh, the need to really carry out arguments that used to be arguments you could have between the, the parties. Um, and I would like to look forward to a day when we had a more reasonable uh, kind of Republicanism where we could have, uh, some, uh, have debates 
and where we didn't have to worry so much uh, for those of us who are either moderate or progressive when the other side won an election. Um, but all that was even before Donald Trump. And now, if you accept my analysis of what happened to the Republican Party, then Trump does not become purely an accidental figure who took control over the Republican Party. There were forces at work in the Republican Party uh, that helped to bring this about. Um, and I, I point to a couple of more recent events as the beginning of Trumpism. Um, when George W. Bush was president, many of you, anybody who read my column knows that I was very critical of uh, President Bush, um, of the Iraq war and of a number of other things that happened, not to mention a great critic of a, an unfortunately quite relevant to our moment Supreme Court decision, Bush v. Gore. Um, the, but at, at the same time, I recognize that George W. Bush saw certain things about how America was changing um, and how a politics should respond uh, that I admired him for. One was his awareness that we are becoming a more diverse country uh, and that President uh, George W. Bush went out of his way uh, to reach out to Latinos in our country uh, to understand that the Republican Party would have no long-term future if it was simply a party of older white people. Um, and he supported a very progressive uh, immigration reform bill. That bill died uh, in his second term. And it didn't die because Democrats voted against it. Two thirds of Democrats voted for George W. Bush's immigration reform bill. Two thirds of Republicans voted against it, led by uh, Senator Jeff Sessions, who, as you all know, later became uh, uh, Donald Trump's uh, first attorney general. It seemed to me that battle over immigration with the majority of the Republican Party turning on President Bush over immigration uh, was the first shot in the rise of Trumpism. Um, I think the Tea Party was also another shot in the rise of Trumpism because the Tea Party itself was deeply um, rooted in one of the strongest sentiments within the Tea Party was uh, strenuous opposition uh, to immigration. But then you also saw it in the movement that gave Donald Trump his first, other than his TV show, his first big uh, presence on the national scene, which is the birther movement, uh, the notion that President Obama uh, was not really born in the United States and therefore shouldn't be president. By the way, one of my favorite polls in that period uh, found that 6% of Americans felt that Obama was not eligible to be president because he was born in Hawaii. Um, just so I, I want to meet those 6% uh, uh, in that survey. Um, the uh, the Republicans, a lot of Republicans said, oh, we don't really believe that, but they didn't really disown uh, Donald Trump. There were many of them at the time, including, um, you know, Speaker Boehner, uh, you know, a really decent human being, Speaker Boehner was, but he didn't really want to get into the argument. He wanted to say, well, people were entitled to their opinions. And uh, so I think the way was a prepared uh, for Donald Trump. Uh, and um, I like to say that what describes what happened to the Republican Party uh, really well was a line from President Kennedy's inaugural address where President Kennedy said, uh, he who rides to power on the back of the tiger usually ends up inside. And I think that's what happened to the establishment wing of the Republican Party. Uh, so how do we move forward? I obviously, it's no secret that I think we move forward in part by defeating Donald Trump. Um, but I also think it's important we, we have to move forward by dealing with some deeply embedded issues in our country. And I write about that in Code Red, but they have really come into relief during this uh, pandemic. Um, it's been said by many others uh, as well that the pandemic is really an X-ray on our social and political state uh, right now as a nation. Um, just think of the divisions in the country that the pandemic has uh, brought home. Um, those of us who can work on devices like the one I am speaking on now and the one you are talking, you are watching me on, those of us who can stay at work through these devices, um, many of us have suffered hardly at all in the pandemic. Until the last few days, very wealthy people who had their money in the stock market actually prospered uh, in the, uh, during um, the pandemic. 
Um, but two other kinds of people were hit very, very hard by the pandemic, those who were rendered unemployed uh, as the economy shut down in many key sectors, and those whom we now call the essential workers, who were really for many years the forgotten workers, the folks who deliver our packages, the folks who, uh, who work in the hospitals, the folks uh, who uh, pick up our garbage and work in the supermarkets. Uh, these are people who worked for very low wages. We didn't call them essential workers. We largely ignored them um, as a nation. Uh, and now we realize how essential um, their work is. That's one way in which the pandemic has underscored how much we do need social change in our country. The second way is healthcare itself. Um, the number of people who have lost their health insurance as they lost their jobs. Um, the fact that the pandemic hits very differently uh, in affluent and poor communities, in black as opposed to white communities. Um, the, the inequalities both in access to healthcare and in health outcomes has been brought home by this pandemic. So we've got to get the pandemic under control. At the same time, we have to um, uh, remedy some of these deep inequalities um, in our economy. Um, secondly, we've seen the deep racial divisions in our country that have been brought home in recent years. I believe our country cries out for both racial justice and racial healing. And you can't have racial healing without racial justice. Uh, the kind of leaders I long for are leaders uh, like one of my political heroes and probably a political hero to many people on this call, Robert F. Kennedy. Um, and one of the most powerful things about Robert Kennedy um, it was his ability to speak with credibility, both to black Americans who understood that deep in his bones, he was on their side and he understood the costs of racial injustice in our nation and its long endurance in our history, uh, but also white working class people, uh, people in the Scrantons of America or the Fall Rivers where I uh, came from or the Erie's or the Reddings and we go right through uh, the Midwest. Um, and Robert Kennedy understood that just as there were deep injustices of race, so there were deep injustices of class and indeed, um, among uh, our African-American and uh, Latino brothers and sisters often suffer the double whammy of both racial and uh, class injustice. Uh, I think the time has come to remedy these uh, forms of racial injustice. We need what a great writer uh, for the Atlantic, Adam uh, Serwork, uh, called a third reconstruction. Um, but we need to do that in tandem with economic change um, that lifts up uh, communities in our country across racial lines uh, that have suffered from economic change over the last uh, 30 years, from the downside of economic change uh, over uh, the last 30 years. I talk a lot in Code Red about dealing with both issues of racial inequality and of class um, inequality, and that, uh, that connects uh, to the economy. Uh, and yes, we've got to deal with these pro the problems created uh, by climate change, because uh, if we don't have a planet, if we don't have a place to live, none of the rest of these things matter, uh, but we have to deal with the climate uh, uh, in a way that creates jobs, and I think uh, that is very possible. Um, so I, I just want to close by saying a couple of things. Um, I think that what we need in our country is patriotism as an alternative to nationalism. Um, Charles de Gaulle had a great line that I ran across recently. I know it's not popular in America to quote Charles de Gaulle, uh, but he was a very smart guy. Uh, and de Gaulle said, patriots are people who love their country first uh, and nationalists are people who hate others who are not part of their country first. Uh, I think that we can have a love of country uh, without either a hatred of other countries or a denial that we are not alone in this world uh, or a denial of the fact that we need allies. Uh, and I think that what we need in our country is an inclusive patriotism that takes very seriously uh, the first word of the Constitution of the United States. If we were in a room, I would ask everybody on this call what the first word 
of the Constitution is. And I won't have you all fiddling for your uh, button there. You all know that the first word of the Constitution of the United States is the word we. And I love asking this to audiences because I love having a whole audience say the word we. We don't say we enough uh, anymore uh, as a country. We tend to look at others as having defective views. They're all wrong about this. Uh, we, have, we have a degree of um, hatred in our country uh, uh, along political lines like I have never seen in my lifetime. I always like to tell the story of my dear Uncle Ray, whom I have argued politics with for 35 years. Uh, and uh, you could tell how divided we were as a country by how ferocious our arguments were. Uncle Ray was very conservative, but I loved him very dearly. And when he died, his kids, bless them, asked me to do the eulogy at his funeral. And I made a point of uh, quoting Richard Nixon in my eulogy for him, um, partly because I liked the Nixon quote, but partly, as I said to people in the church, I quoted Nixon because I knew if I thought maybe if Uncle Ray heard me quoting Nixon, he'd come back to life just to tell me, I knew you'd be quoting Nixon someday. Um, but I think now I've thought often in the last four years uh, that I'm not sure my Uncle Ray and I could even argue about politics now. Some of you may have this experience in your own uh, families where we are now so divided. It's one thing to be divided and have arguments and still love each other. It's another where even arguing becomes so divisive uh, that you simply stop talking about politics altogether, or in some cases, I've heard parts of families simply don't talk to each other anymore. That is not a healthy situation uh, for a democracy. But that word we also matters in another way, that all of American history, and I think no one spoke about this more powerfully than Barack Obama, particularly in his speech in Selma, our long trajectory has been to try to move toward greater equality uh, and greater inclusion. Our whole struggle is to make that word we mean all of us, mean every uh, American. And we cannot give up on that struggle. Um, and we have made enormous progress, but we still have a long way to go. So I think we need a re-engagement of a kind of patriotism uh, that lays heavy, heavy stress on the weeness of us as a country. And that weeness also means that we realize that we are all in this together. Now that's a political cliche, you hear that a lot at election time, but I don't think there's anything like a pandemic uh, to remind us of what that means, of what it means for all of us to be in this together. Uh, if the clerk at a store has COVID uh, and you go to that store, uh, you could get COVID too. If a kid who goes to school with your child uh, does not get health care, uh, that child can spread disease to your child. In other words, we ought to be uh, looking out for each other because that is the right thing to do. I am a Catholic. I was greatly shaped by Catholic social thought and by the notion of, the, of a common good. Um, but even if you're not really concerned about a common good, there is nothing like a pandemic to teach you uh, that we really do depend upon each other and upon each other's prosperity. But that's also true of the economy uh, itself. Uh, our economy works best when everybody prospers, when wealth is widely distributed, um, when people can spend money on goods and services, uh, go to their local small business, lift each other up. There's a great story about Walter Ruther, the great leader of the United Auto Workers Union being given a tour of, the, of a GM plant and uh, they, it was said uh, he went into an automated part of the plant where robots were putting together cars. And the head of GM looked at Walter Ruther and said, you know, uh, Mr. Ruther, uh, those robots aren't going to be paying dues to your union. And Ruther looked at the, uh, the uh, president of GM and said, yes, and those robots aren't going to be buying GM cars either. Um, we have to think about how the prosperity of some of us affects uh, the prosperity of all of us. Um, the final thing is, uh, I think we need to learn to be hopeful about our country again. I am a glass one-tenth full person. That's a very dangerous thing to be. Um, but I do tend to have 
um, a, a sense that our country's greatest gift um, has over its history been its capacity for self-correction. Um, I love the Churchill line that many of you know uh, that America always does the right thing after first exhausting all of the other possibilities. Uh, we've been doing a heck of a job in the last uh, few years, exhausting all of the other possibilities. But I believe there's a lot of truth in that. We were a country, we began as a slave country uh, and we abolished slavery. We were deeply segregated for a hundred years and we abolished segregation. We haven't ended racial injustice, but we are a very different country than the country that I was born into on racial matters. We had wild economic inequalities and with programs beginning with the, the progressive era and the new deal and the new frontier and the great society, uh, we created a lot of forms of opportunity that didn't exist with the labor movement. Uh, we lifted a lot of people up uh, in jobs that used to be seen as dreadful and dead end uh, jobs. Our country has an enormous capacity uh, for self-correction. And my hope is that after this very difficult, very divisive period, um, we can begin to come together again. It will not be easy. Uh, we will, some of these divisions are going to last. We may have a difficult time even counting the votes in a few days. We may even argue about how uh, we count those votes. Uh, but I think that the, the, the problems we have in common are too great for us to stay divided forever. And I have a lot of confidence in the generation coming up. I, my book is dedicated to the new generation and uh, we have three kids in their 20s and I always tell them that um, I know the country is gonna be okay because I know when my generation is gone and their generation takes over, we're gonna be a better country because they are, I think, more open, uh, more tolerant. Uh, uh, less uh, bigoted, if you will, than the older generation that I am part of. Um, and the only problem with my theory to my children uh, is that, um, you know, because I'm suggesting that when our generation is gone and they take over, we'll be fine, is I want to be around to see uh, this America that I think we will create. So I want to speed that process up. I want us to make the change in our generation. And one of the exciting things about this election uh, I am, as you probably know, over 60 years old, as some of you are. Um, what's really exciting is that this is the first election in a long time where the older generation and the youngest generation are actually voting together. They're actually voting the same way. They want to move in the same place. I cast my ballot this year at a drop box at my children's high school. Uh, it was Walt Whitman High School, named after the great poet of democracy, um, I think those of us on the older end should want to join hands uh, with young people and create a country that we dreamed of when we were young and that they will make possible. And I want to thank you all for being here today. Uh, and may you vote in Pennsylvania uh, and uh, enjoy the central role that your state and your city are now playing uh, in our politics. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. See, the good thing about Zoom is the only screens I saw were where people were clapping. So bless you all for uh, I, bless you all for that. And I'd be very happy to answer uh, to uh, I love Q and A, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Who wants or to go for first? The comments. I'm used to, as my story goes, I'm used to arguing with people. So I do not mind people who devoutly disagree with me. That's what freedom is all about. Uh, go ahead. There's David, go ahead. I'm gonna um, go on speaker view so I can see you. Can you see me? Uh, there you are. Yes, sir. Oh, I see that Biden sign back there. Okay. Yeah, I was an alternate delegate to the convention, so. We oh, met every morning and by Zoom, and I had that. Yeah, a um, couple of a uh, couple of things. Uh, one, uh, your idea on the Republican Party uh, uh, and moderate Republicans. Uh, Stuart Stevens has come out, uh, and I'm not, I don't mean to plug his book over, 
over yours, I think you could read all books, uh, and said that- I'm all for, my essence, mother was a uh, librarian, racism, so I like plugging all books. Go ahead. <laughs> in, in essence, that uh, the racism that we've seen was not a recessive gene in the party, but it was a dominant gene in the party. And, uh, you know, he's been joined by a lot of the Republicans you refer to who have left, uh, Rick Wilson's, the uh, uh, Steve Schmitz, the Lincoln Project people. Um, but I was wondering um, what you see Republicans, as it's been defined as a conservative party, what, what they are standing for, what they will eventually stand for other than to block the liberal agenda or to go down this racist path uh, that, that they've had um, in, in terms of what, what, what really is their policy. I mean, you know, and who might be a leader in that? Uh, years ago, Bill Buckley sort of had that, that R around him. He, he effectively expelled uh, uh, those folks in Southern California who were anti-Semitic. Uh, uh, and the Birchers uh, you know, also. Yeah, yeah. So. Where do you see that that going, and you know, and the interplay of uh, how how they get how we get over that race uh, issue? Well, I think since 1964, the Republicans have been on this trajectory. It's worth remembering that back in '64, some of the leading supporters of the Civil Rights Act, from people like Javits or Rockefeller or um, you know Bill McCullough from uh, um, uh, from Ohio, even I, you Scott in your state, uh, not somebody I always agreed with, but also supported civil rights. Um, and starting with the, with Goldwater and moving forward, the party leaned more and more on racial division to win elections. Nixon's Southern uh, strategy, the Willie Horton campaign run by President George H.W. Bush, who in many ways was a very, very decent man, much more of that older moderate uh, tradition. Um, so it has become very central uh, to the party's appeal. Um, I'm not sure where um, this comes from. I, I was just talking today, in fact, to um, a couple of Republican uh, pollsters uh, where you really need a bottom-up renewal uh, of that party. I think there are, um, and I am very curious how much Republicans are going to break with Trumpism, even if Trumpism loses, because so many of the kinds of Republicans who would have pushed back against this as the Lincoln Project shows, have left the Republican Party altogether. Um, and my only hope is the Republicans will look at this demographic change in the country uh, and say, here and survive as a party. Let me point to one place that might be worth looking at uh, if you had a more moderate form of conservatism. And kinds of people who I think of as conservative whom I admire are some of those post-war leaders like Dwight Eisenhower, Harold Macmillan in Britain, Adenauer in Germany. These were people who did not want to repeat the Great Depression and sure as heck did not want to repeat Nazism or World War II. And so they had a real moderation about themselves where they said, we need a welfare state, we need a just economy, um, and we need to support democracy against authoritarianism. Um, there's a new, there's a think tank in Washington called the Niskanen Center uh, that is trying to create a form of moderation, kind of conservative moderation, that accepts the need for a social safety net, that accepts that supporting um, government programs doesn't automatically make you a socialist, but they are very free market. Among all the people kind of doing thinking you know, I am, as I say, my politics are more liberal or social democratic, but among all the people on the conservative side who are trying to think through a coherent alternative to this kind of republicanism, those are the people I think are doing the most interesting work. The problem is they still may be too liberal for what this Republican party at the moment can tolerate, but you might take a look at their website because they, they've written and thought about a lot of interesting things and they're very pro-market, um, you know, they, in many ways, they do fit in with what we used to think of as the Republican Party. But I appreciate your question. Thank you. Um, who, who else wants to please uh, come in? Paula, go ahead. Paula, it looks like you have a question there. Go ahead. Yeah. 
I'm, okay. I'm so concerned about the fact that so many of these Republicans are referring to the fact that uh, America First movement has been paying for their ads. People don't realize what America First is all about, including Bogart, who is now running against Matt Cartwright. He says he ends all of his ads, almost all of them, with America First. Why, are, why aren't we doing something about that? What all I unfortunately, um, history is not always everybody's favorite subject. It's one of my favorite subjects. It's clearly one of your favorite subjects. Uh, people might usefully watch the Lindbergh movie uh, from the Philip Roth book uh, that uh, was on the air uh, earlier uh, this year. People have forgotten that America First was the slogan of the group in the United States that resisted going to war against the Nazis and the fascists. And that's just true. And, you know, I think a lot of people have pointed it out over the years. I've mentioned it in my columns. A lot of people have talked about that. Um, but, um, you know, the the argument made back by those who are contemporary America first are saying, you know, that's then this is now we are against uh, I don't know exactly what they're against, but we're against giving America away to the Chinese or whoever, whomever, and we're against all of these alliances. Um, and the kind of, I, I think the kind of argument we need to muster to, that does link back to that history um, is to say that putting America first uh, in these terms is actually not putting America first because if you care about America and American democracy, then you understand uh, that democracy is best defended uh, in alliance with others, uh, with like-minded democracies and not by the way, in alliances with autocrats uh, around the world. Uh, if you wanna put the American worker first, uh, then uh, a just economy uh, has to be defended um, you know, uh, in common with other uh, with other countries. Uh, I think where some of the America First folks get traction and obviously in a place like Scranton or in my hometown, um, this is automatically understood. But I think there is a feeling that trade deals were made uh, and our economy was modernized in ways that didn't really have the interests of people who would be displaced by those trade deals in mind. And every time we made a trade deal, people in the factories were promised, don't worry, uh, all, this will benefit most people and we'll help those that it doesn't benefit and we'll help people move to better jobs. And those, that second half was not done often enough. So I think it is very important that even people who are broadly sympathetic to free trade I need to recognize that not all of free trade has worked out well for people in towns like Scranton, uh, and that we have not done enough for um, uh, blue collar workers who are displaced. It doesn't mean we can recreate the same manufacturing jobs that existed before, but we really do need to think about um, how to move people uh, toward well-paying jobs in other parts of the economy. And um, I think one of the reasons Biden has done quite well in this campaign is he's talked very explicitly about that. I think he, I am somebody who, really had a lot of respect for Hillary Clinton. So I don't like to go back and bash her campaign. I voted for her. I have no regrets about that. I don't think anybody on this call who did has any regrets, but I fault her campaign. And I mentioned this in, in um, my book um, in not focusing enough on some of the very economic ideas she had uh, to lift up places like Scranton and Reading and wilkes um and Erie. Uh, where something like 34% of the Trump ads uh, back in uh, 2016 mentioned economics and only, I think it was 9%, a very good political scientist called Lynn Vavrick did this study. Um, and I wish Hillary had talked more about the economy. So that's where I think those of us who are on the progressive side need to join the argument with folks who say America first, but you are 100% right. We should remember um, that America first, when it was originally coined, uh, would not have left democracy or human liberty in very good shape in this world of ours. So thanks for bringing that up. I always equate America first with being isolationists. Right, right. And those were the folks who did not want to ally uh, to fight uh, to, uh, you know, to fight Hitler. Um, and of course, uh, don't forget they were also 
great anti-Semites. Right, well, the American First Movement, just to be fair to history, was a really broad range of people. There were some left-wing, lefty socialist pacifists in it, people who hated war. Uh, there were, it was a real coalition. If you go to, uh, if you look at the history of America First, Sergeant Shriver was in America First, thoroughly admirable human being. Uh, you know, it was a big coalition, but the, the right wing of America First was deeply disconcerting because, you know, um, they, they really did not see an, an obligation to uh, turn back um, Hitler in, in the way I think people should have felt uh, an obligation at that time, and eventually we did. Um, um, who wants to come in? Uh, 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 he, Dr. He, Sweeney, he, Dr. Sweeney, do you have a question? He, no, no, I don't have a question Allison, right now. Allison, oh. Oh, I'd, okay. I'd love to hear from you, Dr. Sweeney, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Maury, go ahead, Maury. Okay, EJ, back, Sandra's husband again. I want to get back to your answer to the first question and persist with that, because it seemed to me that what you were saying is that restoring the Republican Party to its uh, more appropriate days is making it more akin to the Democratic Party. So I ask you, if you were called upon as a chairman of the platform committee of the Republican Party to restore it back to the Republican Party that you felt had a more appropriate function in this democracy, what would that mean? What is the Republican platform of another era? What, when I say uh, you're right in one sense, what you just said is 100% true. I want it to be more like the Democratic Party than it is now. There's a completely different way to say that, which is I want a Republican Party that isn't off on the far right wing, but is closer uh, to the center. Uh, and so when I think of Republicans who fit this bill I am talking about, I am certainly talking about people like Dwight Eisenhower. Um, you know, this is a very odd person to mention historically, but Richard Nixon, for goodness sake, created the Environmental Protection Agency, the Consumer Product Safety Commission. There were a lot of things that Richard Nixon approved of as president uh, as a Republican um, that the Repo a Republican could not do now. Um, the Republican Party of George, as recently um, as George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush, uh, signed the Americans with Disabilities Act. He passed a Strength and Clean Air Act. This Republican Party in the past cooperated with the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So uh, I think that uh, a Republican Party would probably be somewhat less redistributionist than I am, would probably be more critical of regulation than I am, um, would be uh, wholehearted in its uh, defense of capitalism, where I give uh, two chairs or one chair, but not necessarily three chairs. There would be differences uh, across the parties, but you would have, um, uh, you know, I, I've always, I've told my kids before, I want to go back to a time when um, if the other side loses an election, if the side I'm not for wins, I don't want to be scared. Uh, I wasn't scared when George H.W. Uh, Bush beat Mike Dukakis. I haven't liked Mike Dukakis. I'm from Massachusetts. But there's nothing scary about that. And he was a perfectly responsible president. Um, so I'm not sort of proposing to go to make the party as liberal as some of my liberal Republican heroes like Javits. But I think they are now at a very extreme place where the party's only interest, uh, other than this kind of cultural conservatism and racial backlash, is in tax cuts and deregulation. Mm -hmm. I'd like them to be more interested in more issues and mm -hmm. to understand that pure capitalism has never worked and that the people who have tended to save capitalism are capitalism's critics who know that it can't stand on its own. But uh, I think that Ike and George H.W. Bush are hardly uh, left-wing figures and that's where I would uh, sort of talk about. Is that responsive to your uh, question? Well, I'm still, you're chairman of the Republican Platform Committee. What is your platform? Well, we know from their convention this year, they don't pass platforms anymore. They just say <laughs> we're for whatever uh, Donald Trump is 
for. Um, no, but it would be a platform. I mean, I'm not going to lay out all the planks, but it would be a platform that that would talk a lot about free enterprise, but would acknowledge uh, the need to provide health care for people that, you know, Taft said that the market uh, couldn't uh, provide all the housing we needed or the health care we needed. Ike said that um, the market is great, but we need to help people go to college. We need to build public works. Um, so it's a party that embraces the market, that is sympathetic to the American uh, form of capitalism, but acknowledges reforms that need to be made uh, along the way. Uh, so I think it's a um, the Edmund Burke conservatism. Burke talked about um, a I, I think it's a proclivity to preserve and a desire to improve. Um, and I think that's conservatism. You try to preserve the institutions you revere, but understand that you won't save them if you don't improve them. Um, and that's the kind of conservatism that I think the Republican Party needs and doesn't really have right now. Okay, one last- but Thank question. you. Someday you and I can sit around that nice yeah. conference table and we'll write them a uh, platform and see okay. what they make of it. Can we get Dr. Your Meyer. Forecast? Can we get your forecast on Tuesday? Oh yeah, I, as I said earlier, I, um, I stopped uh, making predictions, but um, it's hard to find, it's much easier to find paths for Biden than for Trump. And so if you asked me to predict, I would predict Biden. Um, and it might be by a substantial margin. One of the things that um, uh, people forget with polls is you know, there are two tails to a poll. It can be wrong one way or it can be wrong the other way. And Democrats are so filled with PTSD from 2016 <laughs> that they only look at the tail that says, well, Biden's ahead now, but, you know, look what happened in 2016. But there's the other side, which is maybe he's ahead by more than this. some of these surveys uh, indicate. The reason, I, I think there are a number of reasons why this is different from 2016. First, Trump was not president then. He's been president for four years and has a record and a very substantial majority of Americans disapprove that record. Um, secondly, Biden is more popular or less unpopular than Hillary Clinton was so that despite his efforts, Biden, uh, Trump has not been able to turn Biden uh, into an effective uh, enemy. Um, third, you have voter turnout on a level that you have never seen. Um, you probably have not seen since the 19th century. Um, fourth, uh, this is from a Republican pollster friend. At this stage of the, this was written about a week ago. At this stage of 2016 in a four-way race, 16.2% of the vote was undecided or voting for a third party candidate. At this stage of 2020, only 5.8% are undecided um, or voting for a third party candidate. Uh, lastly, Hillary lost because of James Comey. James Comey, his equivalent, has not made an appearance yet. The Trump campaign hoped the Hunter Biden story would be this year's James Comey. It's not. I think it's a little late for that kind of intervention. So for all those reasons, uh, um, I am inclined to think that Biden will win, and I would not be shocked if he won by quite a lot. But uh, I've been wrong before, uh, so um, you can. Uh, but I, I think this is really a consensus forecast that I am offering from an awful lot of people who spend an awful lot of time uh, looking at the numbers. I can paint you a small path that Trump has, which passes through Pennsylvania, and it passes through a Pennsylvania where whose result gets tied up in a lot of litigation if it's close. Um, uh, but that's a very difficult path, I think. Um, what do you think, by the way, since you're sitting there? I'm curious what your read is. I agree with you. I agree with your analysis huh. and with your forecast. I have been uh, huh. forecasting a landslide for six months. Now, that, that's been more hopeful than analytical, but uh, I think it's possible. A landslide. Yep. Well, we will know soon. Thank you so much. A landslide would save a lot of trouble in litigation. You wouldn't have to sit around that uh, table so much <laughs> after uh, the election. Um, um, one second, Dr. Dr. Dahmer, before you go, he has a question. 
Oh, thank you. You didn't have to. I, I didn't mean to cut in on Dr. Meyer there. I'm going to have to hear about that. So, and I'm sure the question he has is better. But I want I want to thank uh, Dr. Young. I doubt it. <laughs> I'm sure you have a great question. No, Go no, ahead. no. I, I want to thank you because as a as a, someone who's considered himself a, a moderate Republican for 30 years, I, I really was interested and 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 enjoyed the history of it and you know what it should be and even uh, Mr. Meyer's comments, you know, questions. I, I, that was really elucidating for me. To, you know what what a moderate Republican should be. So I really appreciate that. The one thing that I was a little bit nervous about, and I also agreed the point about we. You know, the we was so important and sh and should be emphasized more. Uh, what I am a little bit nervous about is the. Uh, assumption. I'm not saying you said this, but people all of a sudden, when they say you know, say you're Republican, they say, "Well, you must be racist." I, I have a little problem with that. As a moderate Republican, you can imagine that, and as a Catholic, you can imagine how that could be a little offensive. And then, lastly, I just like to say that I think '64. I think you were right. That was the, the year that that it turned. You know, the, the, the Republicans turned towards a a more um, um, race-based system. But I think the emphasis there, and this is my specialization, was crime. I think crime was the thing that turned people and Goldwater in that direction. I, I don't think it was necessarily racism, but they used uh, crime and it was related to people of color. And that's what sort of, and we can, we can document that if you study criminal justice like I do, you can see the elections all went in that crime way. So I'll shut up now and, and let you comment on that and let Dr. Could Mike- I uh, no, thank you for that. I, crime was a two-way street, I think, uh, that on the one hand, there was a crime wave that began in around 1966, 67, and that was real, that wasn't made up, and people were scared, and so crime was a real issue. At the same time, I think it was also a very convenient way uh, to make racial appeals that now Trump makes them quite explicitly, but that, so the, the problem with law and order is yeah, people do want law and order, but you can't have order without law and respect for law and the rule of law. Uh, but that law and order became a symbol that became uh, a racist symbol. Uh, the other thing is, I agree, it's very, first of all, um, uh, I'm, I believe uh, Mark Shields, uh, my friend and colleague, um, said the world is divided into two kinds of people, uh, just like churches are, people who, uh, search for converts and people who hunt for heretics. Um, I prefer to be a convert seeker rather than a heretic hunter. Uh, and you don't persuade people to come over to your side by beginning by saying, all of you are racist. So I agree that it's a mistake uh, to say that. But I was also, when I, I, when I hear sort of uh, African Americans talk about this, there's a great writer, I'm sorry, I haven't been able to turn up my phone here. Um, a great writer called Charles Gabba, who said of the Trump voter in 2016, he said, not all Trump voters are racist, but for all Trump voters, his racism was not a deal breaker. And I think from the point of view of uh, those who care a lot about racism, that's an insightful uh, comment. So I agree, it's, I mean, heck, I, I grew up in a Republican family. I've had Republican relatives uh, I understand exactly what you're saying, but I do think the Republican Party has trafficked a lot in race over a period of time. Um, that's why Stuart Stevens himself, a lifelong Republican, is writing about it. Uh, but I'd like to see the party go back to the traditions of Lincoln, uh, who was the original anti-racist, uh, or at least you know, was the great emancipator who, who ended slavery in America. So. Uh, thank you. And thanks on the moderate Republicans. I appreciate that. Okay, Dr. Meyer, you're up. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Harry. Good, good question. And uh, thank you for the talk, EJ. Um, I, I, like you, I like to argue. And so I was looking for things that I would disagree with. And then oh, good. Out on. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't find much, unfortunately. Uh, but I still have a question or two just to see what you, you think. Um, one is about, you know, the claim that the Republican Party has kind of been a, a progressive radicalization uh, in moving maybe from Goldwater to Reagan and into Trump. Uh, do you think that that's true, that, that Trump can be understood as a radicalization of what's kind of going on, let's say, in Reagan? Or is it is it something different uh, that's come to the fore? So kind of a, a paradigm shift in, in a way. So it's one question about the Republicans. Uh, two, about the Democrats. Um, uh, you know, the, the book is written with a concern about as I understand it, moderates and progressives kind of fighting, uh, infighting among the Democrats and then not being able to effectively respond to Trump. Uh, that doesn't seem to be happening with, with Joe Biden. There's a lot of um, kind of unity, I think, at least for now, 
Uh, is that a result of just the, the deep concern that people have about Trump? Or has uh, Biden in some way moved uh, to the left? Have the progressives kind of won in a way in getting uh, a shift within uh, the Biden-Harris ticket uh, to make that um, uh, kind of unity possible? Uh, that's the second one. And the third one, I'm trying to formulate it. I'll just throw out my hope was- I gotta write them down now so okay. I don't- yeah, one well, one's Republicans. Maybe I'll just stop. Maybe I'll stop right there, and then and then see what you think. And then maybe no, no, I'll... go ahead. These are good. Okay, one is about the Republican no, these Party, are, these are very about good. the Democratic Party, and the third one. I think what was so significant about Reagan uh, and his election was a shift in what was called the center of politics, and I think that ev eventually kind of came uh, out with the the shift in the Democratic Party with with Clinton. Um, is that something that's kind of on the table uh, right now? I thought. Uh, and 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 that shift in the center could possibly go really right, uh, could go, possibly go uh, really left. And is that what makes this election kind of so significant or is it, is it something else? Oh, I'm so glad I asked you for the third question because I think the third question answers the first two uh, right. in some ways. Mm -hmm. Which is, I do think that Reagan pulled the entire political conversation to the right uh, uh, as, as Margaret Thatcher did in Britain, uh, yeah. and that both Bill Clinton and Tony Blair were in part responses to uh, a newly conservatized public conversation, um, you know, a, a far more acceptance of pure market uh, economics and the like. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was once asked what her greatest achievement was, and she said Tony Blair because of the ways in which he had pulled the Labor Party uh, toward uh, the middle. Uh, I think that um, that reality began moving to the reality itself began moving to the left after the 2008 economic crash. Mm -hmm. I think the 2008 economic crash underscored the costs of a deregulated capitalism, an excessively deregulated uh, capitalism, underscored the costs of 30 years of rising uh, economic inequality. You can start in the early 70s or 1980, but definitely over that very long period, um, inequality went all the way back to levels that it was at right before the Great Depression. Um, and I think the combination of the crash and rising inequality led people to uh, second thoughts about, uh, you know, does cap can you count on capitalism all by itself to give you what you need? And I think many more people now see that you need a more regulated capitalism, you need certain goods distributed, uh, particularly healthcare. Uh, you can't just have the market guarantee everyone healthcare. It's not gonna work. We've long known that. Most other countries have known that. I think finally it's come to be accepted uh, in the United States. Um, so I think the Democratic Party has moved somewhat to the left uh, because I think the center of gravity in the country has also moved somewhat to the left. And as I argue in the book, I think that on the one hand, we should recognize the ways in which Clinton and Obama were successful on their own terms, but they both left uh, problems unattended to that need to be solved now. And I think that's what, what Joe Biden is basically saying is, I want to pick up where they left off and they, where they left off um, sort of left uh, quite a bit of economic reform to be done. And that's why I think it was possible for Biden to come to terms with Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders um, because that the party has moved in a much more, a somewhat more social democratic direction. The Republicans on the other hand have moved way farther away from the center than the Democrats have. And I have a lot of data I could cite you know, how Republicans in Congress vote, how Republicans answer polling questions for Republicans in the electorate. Um, and uh, you can argue that Trump is a break or you can argue that he is part of a long development. I am in the camp that says uh, that Trumpism did not come out of nowhere, uh, that you saw it in the anti-immigration movement during uh, Bush's years, you saw it uh, back in when George W. Bush was president and they started talking about the real America um, and the real America was somehow the part of America that didn't include the states that voted democratic like the Northeast and the West Coast. 
Um, you saw it, um, as I say, even you know, both in aspects of George W. Bushism, but also in the ways the right wing rejected uh, George uh, W. Bushism. George W. Bush, uh, something I will admire him for forever is when he visited the Islamic Center in Washington, D.C. after 9-11 and gave a short, powerful speech saying, we Americans should not turn on fellow Muslims who are Americans. You know, they are in our military, they are do our doctors, they are our neighbors. Um, that became uh, unpopular in the Republican Party over time. You know, suddenly with Bush gone, we were, or the Fox News was teaching us about the mosque at ground zero and all of that. Um, so I believe that Trump radicalized the party further, but I think he was a vehicle for changes that were taking place in the party uh, over time. Uh, so that is my way of answering uh, all three, I think. Great. Yeah. But I, I appreciate those questions. Thank you. Uh, bless you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, if I have a question. Please. You have a right. You pull this all together. Bless you. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't want to tear it apart. Um, I'm th th thinking about uh, John Meacham's talking about our darker angels. Uh, we, um, I would say, uh, obviously, there are darker angels everywhere. But did the, the atmosphere inspire those people who um, didn't care about, who didn't want, they didn't feel they were part of that we. They were people who um, thought it was okay to do things, uh, to, to talk, you know, about immigrants, about African Americans and so forth. And, and um, seem to hold hold fast with that with those um, ideas where I think that they were inspired or or they were permitted I wish I should say to to express themselves in that way yeah I missed the first part about darker angels um, um, John talks about our, our our darker angels and uh, it's the you know that 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 are you know uh, more or less in charge, if not in charge, are not uh, uh, people who who feel that way are not discouraged from feeling that way and acting that way. Well, let me begin this way, which is I'm a Catholic, so I believe in original sin. And one of my favorite lines is from, uh, I, I'm breaking up a little bit, I apologize. I hope I'm, you're, I'm, you're not losing too much of me. I have my, or, am I okay? I'm, yeah, um, yeah. I'm getting a little instability in my little, connection yeah. here. Yeah, um, I was saying I'm a, I'm a Catholic, so I believe in original sin. And one of my favorite lines is from the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, who said original sin uh, is the only empirically verifiable doctrine of the Christian church, uh, by which he meant it's obvious every day how flawed each of us is. Uh, so I do believe we have both our, you know, we have a capacity to sin and a capacity for salvation. We have our dark side and our, our light side. And that's true of us as a country and that we have gone through different periods in our history, in fact, where we have had periods of reform and inclusion and we've had periods of reaction where sometimes we took away um, the, uh, tried to take away the rights or we had granted people reconstruction and then the rollback to Jim Crow is a perfect example uh, of that. Um, I, I tend to, I also tend to be one of those that argues that it's not just individuals who make these choices, it's also social movements um, and economic circumstances. I think it tends to be easier for us to be generous to each other uh, when we have a thriving economy and uh, wealth and income are widely shared. Um, and so I think that Trumpism um, and its darker side um, was not so much enabled, but given fertile ground uh, in which to take root uh, because of the economic changes that left parts of the country uh, behind. Um, and so I, you know, my remedy, if you will, is to I think we ought to be able to acknowledge two things at the same time. On the one hand, wherever we encounter racism, we should condemn it, and we need to continue to push for racial equality and racial inclusion. 
On the other hand, we should not deny that if we have an economy that doesn't deliver for everyone, if significant numbers of people um, are, feel excluded, including Americans who are white, feel excluded from opportunity, uh, they may well lash out. And they can lash out in a number of different ways. Um, I would prefer that they lash out in ways that would push for economic reform. But people who favor economic reform have to make a plausible case to them that that path is going to work for them. Um, and so, um, you know, I, again, I, I come back well, to needing uh, to bring the two forms of equality together. But go ahead. Maybe I didn't answer your question. Well, I, well yes, but then I brought up the other question, and that is of the, uh, economic equality, where we have uh, this growing, uh, uniquely growing gap between rich and poor which uh, doesn't, uh, I, I don't, it's, there would just be a question about how long we can go on that route without some severe uh, problem. Right, well, that's precisely what I, I agree with that 100%. And I think that Trumpism is a weird manifestation of that inequality as well. Um, and I don't think it's good for us economically to be this unequal. It's certainly not good for us socially to be this unequal. You can have capitalism, you can have a competitive market without this degree of inequality. Um, we had a competitive market in the past where CEOs felt a moral um, obligation not to raise their pay to two or 300 times the pay of the average worker. Mitt Romney's dad, George Romney, was very insistent that his pay not go up too much as head of General Motors. We had that kind of ethic within capitalism. So I, I do think that we move toward much more of a winner-take-all kind of economy that I don't think is socially healthy and I actually don't think is economically sustainable. Um, but even if it is, it ain't a good idea. <laughs> yeah. That is my, okay. uh, uh, my apologies. No, that's okay. Um, uh, but if, you, now people know that I have the Brandenburg Concerto as my uh, ringtone. <laughs> I, approve of, I approve of that, <laughs> like I approve of your uh, this ad. Uh, and I, I don't want to be the last if there are other questions, but in case I am, I want to say uh, a couple of things. First of all, how grateful we are. Second, I hope we are going to sell lots of your books. And third is, uh, I'd like you to promise to come back in the flesh. I would love to come. I would absolutely love to come. So you got a promise okay. and now, and you got a lot of witnesses too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. And there, so I can't go back some... on it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> they, well, you didn't go back on the one that we made uh, in New, New York and uh, I'm very happy and grateful. Uh, I just don't want to see, we, we have a few more minutes. I don't know, I'm, I wanted to say that closing and thank you not to close it if there is another question or two that you can answer. Um, is there anybody else out there? I'm sure. To, uh, um... Allison, this is Mike Squires. Go ahead. Yeah. So two questions related to the Supreme Court. One is, are we ah. over or uh, underestimating the role of uh, Charles Koch or the Koch brothers in regard to their impact on the Supreme Court? And two, is it possible that we'll see John Roberts save the reputation of the Supreme Court? Ah, so I think the Koch brothers were an important piece of a larger story. Uh, I think the, in other words, I don't blame it all on the Cokes. I think this has been a, goes all the way back to Lewis Powell back in the 70s, who began to organize a new right and a, um, you know, and began the financing of a conservative movement, including a conservative legal movement. The Cokes were very important piece of that, um, uh, uh, but they are part of a larger uh, story. Uh, second, I am one of those people who actually now does support court enlargement. Um, I insist on not calling it court packing because they're the ones who did the packing and we're trying to balance it off. Uh, and that I would not necessarily feel this way, 
if you had not had both the blocking of Merrick Garland and the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett under these circumstances two weeks before the election. But now I think this is an abuse of power uh, and a power grab within the court that is very dangerous. Uh, and I think that needs to be responded to. Um, I have, uh, I do not think uh, John Roberts is the solution to the problem, but he has shown some signs of understanding uh, that if the court goes too far, it will be courting sentiments of the sort that I am talking about. One of, one of the reasons I am for court enlargement is to send a message to uh, conservatives on the court that if you go too far, lots and lots more people are going to come to this position. Um, you know, if you throw out the ACA, if you intervene in the election uh, in ways that seem unfair, um, if you radically roll back environmental regulation, there are a whole series of things a right wing court could do um, that would create a real rebellion in the country. Now, I do think that Roberts is sensitive to the court's reputation. And I was very struck in the two decisions we just got on the election uh, that Roberts sided with the liberals in not wanting to disturb uh, the lower court rulings. And I think going forward, it's going to be very interesting to see if Roberts tries to find another conservative ally, in this case, it was Kavanaugh, um, uh, to steer the court away from outright confrontation. Um, I think he'll do that on some issues, uh, but I'm not sure he's gonna do it on all issues. And I find it hard to forget that it was Roberts who led to the Citizens United decision that undercut campaign finance law. And it's Roberts who led the way to gutting the Voting Rights Act. So it's not like John Roberts, John Roberts really is a conservative, uh, but, I think he does have some concern uh, that um, the, the, I think he probably realizes that the very way Barrett was put on the court uh, has created a firestorm in the country. Um, and I suspect he is worried about that. And I will do, I think all of us on our side of things should do everything in our power to make him worry about that. Uh, because I think that's the only way to guarantee any degree of moderation from what is now a genuinely right-wing court. Thank you. Thank you. Can Have you I do one more? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, Joe, you have to unmute there. Oh, did we lose him? Joe? I don't see where he went here, hold on. Um, Sharon, did you have a question in the meantime? I did. Um, and it is much too long. Can you come a little closer? Can you come a little, yeah. It's much too long a question to pose as the caboose. And oh, go it ahead. Is that, it is that um, I, for one, have said that what I would really like to see is a viable third party. And every time I say this, people will say, it's never going to happen. And when I read your uh, description of this presentation, I thought, is there a possibility that these two groups that you're talking about could actually come together and actually become a viable third party that has more balance and um, and more consensus. And that's my question, but it's too long to pose at the end of the thing. No, I have a fairly straightforward answer, which I, I you, you seems like such a wonderful person. I hate to disappoint you uh, on your third party uh, question. Um, for now, those two forces are coming together in a party called the Democratic Party. And I think the Democratic Party is actually the only vehicle available under current circumstances for uh, this set of views. I am a general skeptic of a uh, third party um, uh, within a two party system because what our history tells us is that it takes a really big specific issue to blow up 
uh, a, a uh, ongoing two-party system. It took slavery to blow up the previous two-party system, the Democrats and the Whigs. Uh, and I don't quite see that particular issue. And secondly, I don't see where exactly a center party comes from because there are many different kinds of centrist voters. Just put in your head two people. Uh, person one is pro-choice on abortion, but doesn't like labor unions. Uh, person two is pro-life on abortion or anti-abortion and is pro-union. They are both in the middle because one has an, a position we associate as liberal and one as conservative, but they don't agree on anything, those two people you know, using those hypotheticals. Uh, and I don't see a space for a kind of moderation that um, you know, creates a majority compared to the other two parties. Um, and so I don't see on the horizon an issue that will create this. I can see them coming up on the state level occasionally. Maine has had a lot of uh, third party politics. Um, I can see certain local circumstances doing this, but I don't at the moment see uh, a place for this. The one place it might happen is if the Republican Party radicalizes enough, it's possible that a rump of the Republican Party will break off and say, we want to, uh, you know, we want a more moderate Republican Party as an alternative to these Democrats. Maybe that'll happen someday, but for the time being, as I say, I hate to disappoint you, but I don't see it uh, in the cards, at least yet. Um, I'm never disappointed. I just think we have to wait. <laughs> okay, bless you. Thank you very much. Joe is back, and that can be our, our final question there. Great. Uh, I'm back. Okay. Oh, good. Yes. Yeah, very much enjoyed the presentation, and I couldn't agree with you more that our future lies with young people. I taught middle school for 40 years and uh, they always gave me hope. For 40 years? 40, correct. Wow, you got patience, man. 40 years of middle school, that's the hardest. That's very hard, good for I you. Just have, you just have to prove you're crazier than they are and everything works out well. Um, but in the short term, something that hasn't come up, whenever uh, I've tried to have a conversation with, um, people who support Trump or listening to people who support Trump, the degree of misinformation that they are working, the base of facts, quote unquote, from uh, I believe they're watching a Fox News, uh, talk radio, social media. That problem seems to be much a harder nut to crack than political ideologies or parties moving in various directions. And I, I, I get depressed um, thinking about it, listening to people say stuff that's just crazy. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are about that. It is a really good question. I am um, I am very troubled by it too. I'm troubled, first of all, First of all, I'm troubled by the ease with which all of us can sit in particular media bubbles, period, because we can much more easily surround ourselves with people we agree with than we used to. That's true across the board. But I find that the, you know, the information uh, or disinformation on Fox News is genuinely disturbing. A friend of mine who's a pollster <clears throat> has started dividing his sample into you know, independents, obviously, Democrats, and then he's dividing his Republicans into two kinds, Fox Republicans and Republicans. And you know, there's a question in the survey, is Fox News, what is your most trusted source of information? And depending on the survey, 40 to 50% of Republicans say Fox News. And when you compare the two kinds of Republicans, they are substantially, there are some real differences uh, between them, whether people are on a steady diet of Fox or not. Um, and um, it is, and there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, disinformation, half truth out there right now. Um, and, you know, if you look back historically, we used to have a limited number of media sources and that we would basically all watch the three big networks. Um, now, that was a problem. It was not a diversity of view, but we did have a kind of shared sense of what reality is. 
uh, and then we would argue about it in the context of shared uh, shared information, actual information. Now it is very easy to spread around. Uh, you know, there's an old line that a uh, lie can be halfway around the world before the truth gets its shoes on. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot more of that going on. So there was always misinformation. There was always lying. You get leaflets in the mail. You get direct mail pieces. But now it's just like everything else. It's way more efficient. It's being spread way more efficiently. And I do think that's very disconcerting. And there's not an easy way to handle it because you can argue first principles with someone and you can have a real conversation when you disagree. But if um, you say the sky is blue and they say the sky is red, it's very hard to proceed uh, from that basis. And it's not always quite that bad, but uh, so I, yeah, I am very troubled, uh, uh, troubled by this. It's still a minority of us and it's not, the, it's even a minority of the Republican party, um, but it is troublesome and it is very easy to spread information that as I say, I'll just close with this, that this media war we have is magnificent. You can get information from all over the world at your fingertips. Uh, but what makes it efficient in spreading truth and data uh, and knowledge also makes it very efficient at spreading lies and untruth. And I don't know how we can maximize the first and minimize the second, but somehow we got to figure out how to do that. But thank you. And thanks for your service as a teacher. God bless you. <laughs> and thank you for being with us and being so generous with your time. No, a real joy to be with you. Thank you. Yes. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. I must say it was nice to see everybody. <laughs>